Yo, what's up guys? So today we are gonna see, what if, Naruto got harem with female Haku, Tenten, Fu and Samui, part 2, hope you'll enjoy this video. So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, Shadozerson, link is in the description, and also subscribe to my channel, and like this video. Silence engulfed the room, as Naruto showed no outward reaction to the shocking revelation. Shikamaru had his head down on the table, waiting for Naruto's words to break the quietness. Shino had initially shown a reaction to the discovery, but he sculled his face back to normal. The blonde boy stared at the picture so intensely, it was, as if he was trying to burn it with his eyes. What was he supposed to say after discovering the fact that his idol was actually his father? This woman is my mother, and Yandame is my father. Mikoto-sen said that my mother had red hair, which this person has. How do I know Shika knows what he's talking about? Naruto shook his head free of those thoughts. Of course he knows what he's talking about. Why did my dad seal the Kyubi within me? Did he hate me for some reason? Gigi told me that he loved me, but what am I supposed to believe? Udo. Naruto. I said Naruto. He broke from his stupor and looked towards Shikamaru, who had called his name. Do you want to talk about it? The Naruto boy asked. Naruto was unsure of what to do. He obviously trusted his friends. The trust had strengthened further when they accepted that he was the Kyubis. I'll go grab some tea, you want some Shino. Shikamaru got a nod from the user and left the room. Naruto collapsed onto the tatami floor. Many things had occurred in such a short span. The Chiha massacre, the Kyubi secret, and now the discovery of his parents' identities. Shikamaru came back a minute later, carrying a tray with three teacups on it. Each boy took a sip from their cups, and instantly relaxed. Thank you for finding out for me Shikamaru. Okage Jiji told me that he would tell me their identities when I became a Chunin. I understand why now since they probably made tons of enemies that would do anything just to kill me, but I'm honestly glad that I was able to find out sooner. Naruto's words came out smoothly, as a small smile plastered onto his face. What do you plan to do with this information Naruto? Would you ask for your inheritance or choose to remain silent? Shino asked his friend. I honestly didn't even think about my inheritance until you mentioned it. I think I'll keep silent because I know I'm not strong enough to handle most of my parents' enemies. To get to me, they would target my closest people. There's no way they're going to attack the Hokage, so that means you too. Naruto explained, pointing to his friends. Troublesome. Nara voiced his displeasure. Naruto and Shino laughed at Shikamaru. Instantly the pineapple-headed boy and the whiskered boy stared at the other boy in the room. Okami, the world's going to end. Shino openly laughed at something. Naruto thought. Noticing the stares, Shino instantly returned to stoic face and stood up. He glared at them from behind his sunglasses. That doesn't leave this room ever. Do you two understand? Shikamaru and Naruto caught the subtle threat that hung in the air. Will you write about one thing? No information is going to leave this room. Shikamaru said to ease the tension. They all nodded and left the room, as if sensitive information wasn't discussed. Shino returned home for dinner while Naruto was forcibly told to stay for dinner by Yoshino. Two months later, Naruto ducked and weaved through buildings while trying to escape his pursuer. The blonde hid in the shadows and pressed his body up against the wall. Quickly catching his breath, he tried to think of an escape plan, but his thought process was interrupted. The kunai grazed his cheek and his assailant was situated directly above him. The boy fled the scene without looking back. He needed to get to the Hokage Tower, as that was one of his safe havens. He ran into the crowd, and quickly used Henge to change into a civilian. He casually walked, blending in with the villagers. Naruto headed straight towards Training Ground 7, hoping to shake off his enemy by going an alternative route. As he passed the grounds, Ninja Wire surrounded him, and a disguised Naruto was tied up. Got you. The assailant declared. A devilish smile was on his captor's face, as she walked towards him. Her outfit did little to hide her modesty from the world. She wore a scantily clad attire that consisted of a mesh bodysuit and an orange skirt. A tan overcoat was worn loosely over her mesh suit. Her purple hair was styled similar to Shikamaru's. You almost had me, too bad I'm too awesome to fall for your tricks. Your posture was more of a shinobi's than a civilian's. Naruto cursed his fate as the captor put him over their shoulder and used Shunshin to appear in the Tiandai building. He was dragged into a dimly lit room that was commonly used for torture. The blonde was placed on a chair and across from him sat two pissed off men. Good job on catching Naruto, he's known to be able to escape from Anbu. Inoichi congratulated the snake mistress on a job well done. Unlike what he wore to the birthday party, Inoichi wore his jonin attire. Like he can escape from me after what he did. Mirashienko smirked. Uzumaki. The deep voice that belonged to Marino Ibiki got the blonde's attention. The chief of the Tiandai division's black jacket came into view. His blue bandana covered his scarred head from the world. What were you thinking when you decided to replace our tools with non-harmful versions? Ibiki glared at the boy. Naruto had decided to prank the place where criminals were regularly interrogated. It took him an entire week to prepare the tools necessary to accomplish the prank. Am I going to be punished? Naruto asked innocently. 
It had been quite some time since he was last punished for his pranks. As long as you tell me what I want to know, there won't be any punishments. Ibiki said before leaning forward. If you refuse to answer my questions, I'll make sure I'm the one in charge of your punishment. The scarred man threatened. Naruto immediately nodded, clearly getting the message. How were you able to get into this building and replace our tools undetected? Inoichi asked the question. I used Henge to change into you Inoichi-san. I then went around talking about Ino with all of your co-workers. Ino told me that's what you usually do at work besides interrogating. The blonde boy replied. Inoichi looked away in shame, avoiding Ibiki's and Anko's gazes. Naruto continued his explanation. I left the building after remembering the layout and where the tools were kept. I brought lots of clay and molded the clay to have the exact same weight and shape as your tools. I painted the clay with a silver color and glazed it over to give it a metallic shine. I snuck back in as one of your co-workers who had conveniently gotten sick with a stomachache that day. I stole your tools and replaced them with my clay ones before leaving. I got caught by this lady a couple of hours later. The explanation. Also, I should remind you that you weren't allowed to take me in, since you have no evidence to use against me. If I didn't confess to my prank, then you guys would be explaining to the Hokage why you unlawfully captured and interrogated a civilian. The boy boldly told them. Why do you believe we didn't find evidence? Inoichi asked since it was true that they didn't find any evidence. Easy, you didn't call Andrew to bring me in. Naruto replied with a smirk. The three interrogators had a huge headache thanks to the little blonde. No wonder no one attempted to capture him if they were even able to find him. Enko unties him so we can get our tools back. Ibiki ordered, as he rubbed his temples to soothe the pain of being outsmarted by a 10 year old. No need for that, no inuk no jutsu, rope escape technique. Naruto escaped from his bindings, and pulled out a scroll. From the scroll, several instruments commonly used by interrogators came out. Daki, you were able to escape this whole time Enko asked, bewildered by the kid in front of her. Of course. You aren't the first person who has managed to tie me up. I just wanted to see what it would be like to get interrogated by professionals. Naruto answered while explaining his reason. Inoichi could clearly see that Naruto's thought process was completely different from a normal 10 year old. Hey, you never did tell me what happened when you used the clay to injure your so-called victims. Enko decided to answer this question. I was scaring the wits out of this guy, and he was just about to spill. I grabbed him, intending to stab him in the knee. Instead of drawing blood, they bent from contact. Both the guy and I stared at each other before we started laughing. He laughed. I laughed. I then knocked him out with a punch to the gut, and began hearing that everyone else was having the exact same problem. She recapped what happened earlier today. Naruto busted out laughing at their predicament. If there's one thing that we can get out of this, it is that we can now psychologically scare our prisoners, since they won't be able to tell the difference between the real and fake tools. Ibiki grinned manically for seeing the silver lining in this event. Inoichi and Naruto's sweat dropped at Ibiki's happiness. Man, you guys really know how to scare people. Naruto commented as an idea popped into his head. Do you think I can help interrogate someone? Inoichi was flabbergasted at Naruto's question. Why do you want to interrogate someone, if I may ask? The blonde man inquired, not liking the fact that his daughter's friend wanted to interrogate a person. Naruto smirked before pulling out a scroll that contained the book, Shinobi Basics 101. This book says that a shinobi must always control their emotions out in the field. If you let your emotions get to you, you're more likely to make mistakes. I figured that if I was able to manipulate my opponent's emotions, then I'll have a better chance of winning. Enko and Ibiki smiled at his logic. The ability to get under someone's skin was quite useful. An enemy could get caught up in your words, actions, or even clothing. That was why Anko dressed so scandalously, and teased people. Ibiki had a hardened gaze along with an imposing build that deterred enemies. Sorry but you have to be a part of the division to actually interrogate someone. Anko replied, as she killed Naruto's chances with that. Do you happen to have any books or scrolls regarding the subject? Naruto asked since he wasn't going to interrogate anyone anytime soon. I actually think you have the right mindset regarding controlling your emotions, but I don't think you should try to manipulate your opponent's emotions. If you accidentally misjudge how a person is going to react, then that can mean your death. I have seen people taunt their opponent, only to be dead when their opponent went off in rage. Inoichi reasoned with the fellow blonde. What Inoichi says is right. You should spend your time observing your opponent instead. Information is very vital to a shinobi due to the fact that any piece of information can save you from death. Of course, not all information is correct, so you'll have to determine which one's real or fake. For example, when you look at me, what kind of fighter do you see? Ibiki asked Naruto. To me, you're mainly an injutsu expert that also excels in jujutsu. Naruto answered after looking at Ibiki. Ibiki smirked at the answer. I'm actually a jinjutsu expert that excels in ninjutsu. The imposing man replied. Naruto was perplexed because Ibiki didn't seem the type to use jinjutsu. Ibiki saw that Naruto was slightly confused. That information is false. I simply wanted to see your reaction. 
I'm really a shinobi that excels in shurikenjutsu, jinjutsu, and ninjutsu, but I'm not an expert in any field. Naruto was dumbfounded that he was tricked so easily. This time, Anko decided to chime into the conversation. As Ibiki said, information to a shinobi is very vital. The only way to counter that information is deception. Deception is the key to luring your opponent into a trap, and tends to be more effective than taunting. As a prankster, you know about deception since you used a Hinjetto blend into the crowd. You took another route, knowing that I can't stop you if you're at the Hokage Tower. She informed me. Naruto realized he was using deception without realizing it, and how effective it was. So you're saying that if I look weaker, my opponents are bound to underestimate me. Since they underestimate me, it gives me multiple chances to deal a fatal strike. The boy summarized. Sincere, people are bound to underestimate you. Not to mention the fact that you look so freaking innocent. Anko commented, as she pulled on Naruto's cheeks. The blonde boy pouted, which made Anko comment on how cute he looked. Thank you for the lesson Ibiki-san, Inoichi-san, and crazy lady. You helped me learn an important lesson today. Since you helped me, I promise that I won't prank Tia and I headquarters again. Inoichi, and Ibiki sighed in relief while Anko was saddened. Aw, that means I can't chase you around town anymore. The purple-haired woman frowned. Oh well, I can always go play with the prisoners, and my name is Anko, not a crazy lady. Naruto snorted at her. Fine crazy lady, I'll try not to call you crazy lady. He sarcastically replied. Anko pulled out a kunai, which prompted Naruto to bolt the hell out of there. Wait, who told you that you can leave? Come back here. Anko shouted, as she gave chase, leaving the two male interrogators by themselves. I feel sorry for Naruto, Anko finally found someone to play with. Inoichi said while well, Ibiki agreed on the sentiment. Three weeks later, Yugao was heading to Dangoya to meet up with her friends. The Anbu Kanoichi was enjoying a rare day off from duty. Usually she would spend it with her boyfriend, Heide, but he was away on a mission. This led to her having a rare girl's day with her friends. As she entered the Dango shop, her eyes spotted a patch of yellow hair. Naruto Kan, what are you doing here? She asked the boy that had become like a little brother to her. It had been almost three months since Naruto came under the tutelage of Heide. Hei taught the blonde a version of the Kanoha Ryu, Lee style that relied on Naruto's stealth ability, and mastery of the Kawurimi no Jutsu Henge no Jutsu, and Kakurami no no Jutsu, cloak of invisibility technique. The original Kanoha Ryu used distractions and illusions to overwhelm the opponent. Naruto's version attacked the opponent's blind spots from various directions before hiding again. The boy had promptly called his sword style, Keijai Ryu, Shadow Quick Draw style. Yuga thought the name was fitting, considering that most of the attacks were those of the Quick Draw variety. While Naruto was learning the style rapidly, the sword style had a major flaw. As the objective was to hit and run before the opponent could counterattack, fighting in an open area with no places to hide proved to be a weakness. A straight-up fight wasn't ideal for someone of Naruto's skill set. Luckily Heide had devised a way to avoid such a situation. Her boyfriend worked speed was primarily used to catch up to or flee from the opponent. Acceleration was for when Naruto was ready to attack and needed to close the distance. Drawing out the Wakizashi was used when an enemy was able to catch him off guard or to attack swiftly. If he was able to draw his blade fast enough, the blonde would be able to defend her attack. Yugao would sometimes come by and help with the blonde's training. The Anbu woman told him about her and Hades past. She had gotten together with the sickly man due to the fact that she needed to know how to use a sword in order to enlist in Anbu. Sandame had recommended Hade as her instructor. Over time, they got closer and started dating each other. Since she saw Naruto almost weekly, they developed a sibling relationship. For Yugao, it was easy to see the young, as a younger sibling, since she was tasked to watch over him when he was little. The same was for Naruto, as he also treated her like a big sister. It had gotten to the point where the purple-haired woman would scold Hade for overworking her little brother. Of course Naruto came to his sensei's defense every time since he wanted Hei to push him harder. Hey, Yugani. Naruto greeted her. I'm taking a break from my studies. What are you doing here? Is it another date with Hei sensei? Naruto asked the Anbu woman. Yugao, I'm over here. A feminine voice called out to the purple-haired woman. The cat Anbu grabbed her little brother and dragged him to the booth where the voice originated. Kurenai, meet my little brother Uzumaki Naruto. Yugao introduced the Chunin to Naruto. The boy tried to escape from his sister's hold, as he left his dango behind where he sat. Unfortunately she was stronger than him so he relented. The blonde turned to meet the red eyes of the raven-haired woman sitting across from them. Hello Uzumaki-san, I'm Yuhi Kurunai. I'm a friend of Yuga's. Kurunai introduced herself. She wore a unique outfit that seemed to be bandages that had a pattern of thorns on them. Underneath she wore a red mesh blouse with the right sleeve visible. The Jinjutsu user wondered why the name Naruto sounded familiar. She also recalled that Yugao didn't have any siblings. Nice to meet you, Kurunai-san. You can call me Naruto, if you wish. I don't particularly care about honorifics. They replied. Now if you'll excuse me, I'd like to go back to eating my food. Which I was doing before someone dragged me away. 
He looked at Yu Gao, who seemed amused at his words. As he was about to get up, a certain someone walked into the establishment. Hey Kuro Chan. Enko shouted, as she spotted Kuro Nai. Shit, why in the heck is she here? Naruto cursed, as he began panicking. The snake user walked over to the table. The way you're talking Enko stopped in the middle of her sentence, as soon as she saw her favorite. I found you the interrogator woman loudly announced, disturbing the patrons. You can never escape from the great Anko-sama. As Anko was prepared to leap at him, Naruto knew he had to resort to his news. Yugani, this crazy snake lady has been stalking me all over town. Every time I ran away, she would throw it at me. If one of them manages to nick me, she'll appear behind me and lick my blood. Naruto whimpered out the words as he hugged Yugao. In addition to this, Anko would chase him with snakes as well. This promoted her from crazy lady to crazy snake lady. I didn't the Takubetsu Jonin was about to deny the claims when Naruto cut in. The boy activated his new Skoinu no Mi no Jutsu, Puppy Eyes technique. Turning his gaze up to meet the Anbu woman's eyes, he spoke in a scared voice. I'm scared, Yugani, can you protect me? Naruto sniveled, tugging at the woman's heartstrings. Yuga melted instantly from her little brother's actions. She placed him behind her, and patted his blonde hair, as reassurance. An instant later, Yuga's katana was firmly pressed against Anko's neck. You have until the count of five to explain why you sexually assaulted my cute little brother. The Anbu woman said, as she leaked a small killing intent. Everyone gawked at the Kenjutsu user's words. Even Naruto couldn't believe that Yuga thought he was sexually assaulted by Anko. Somehow in his protective older sister's mind, she had twisted his words. 1. Yuga started the countdown. Listen to Yuga. First off, I didn't sexually assault Gaki here. Second, the reason I was chasing him was because he pranked our department. I was the one tasked to bring him in. Anko explained rapidly. Yuga's blade slackened at her words, much to the relief of the snake user. The blonde boy wasn't going to have that, so he pressed his advantage once more. But Yugani, I already went and apologized for the prank. When I was leaving, she started to chase after me for no reason. Ever since, she's been following me around. Naruto whined to Yuga, but he was snickering inwardly. Enko couldn't believe it. The Gaki's freaking acting, but no one else knows that. You won this round, but I'm definitely going to get you back, this thought the Takubetsu Jonin thought. Before Yuga can press the fellow purple-haired female for answers, the earth underneath them shook furiously. What in the world was that? Enko audibly voiced everyone's thoughts. An Anbu came out of nowhere and approached Naruto. Uzumaki-san, the Hokage, requests your immediate assistance. It's of the utmost importance. The operative told the boy. Worried about his grandfather figure, Naruto dashed out of the restaurant and towards the Hokage Tower. So you're on Naruto duty today, Lynx. Yuga spoke to the brown-haired Anbu with the Lynx mask. I'm wondering why you're still here when Naruto has already left. Her eyes narrowed at Lynx, causing him to flinch. The Lynx operative used Shunshin to flee from her wrath. As the Anbu left, everyone went back to their activities. The purple-haired Anbu walked back to the booth where her friends were sitting. Why do you have Anbu watching over your little brother? Kurnai asked, as she wondered if Yuga ordered her subordinates to keep watch over Naruto. The Jinjutsu mistress wouldn't put it past the Anbu captain, considering how protective she was with him in the debacle with Anko earlier. It was originally a volunteer duty because of his status. Yuga whispered to the raven-haired woman. Kurenai was confused at Yuga's words when it clicked with her. Naruto was the name of the boy that contained the Kayubi. I didn't even recognize him since he wasn't wearing that orange monstrosity. Chunin confessed. Yuga stuck her tongue out in disgust as she remembered the horrible thing. He lost that thing over a year ago. Where have you been? The Anbu woman inquired. Anko snickered at Yuga's disbelief. The snake lady had just returned after retrieving a plate of dango. Don't blame Kurchan. She has to keep up the persona of Ice Queen of Kanoha, so she typically ignores everything. Anko explained, her snickering turned into laughter. Kurin I groaned at the title. I hate that name. I don't understand why people call me that. I'm a nice person, and I don't ignore everything. The Ice Queen denied. Anko held up three fingers at Kurin I. 1. You've rejected every invitation that asks for a date. 2. You glare at anyone who does anything remotely perverted. 3. You never smile when you're out in the town. The Takubetsu Jonin put down a finger for every reason. Kurenai fumed at a reasoning. It's not my fault that all men are perverts that just want to get into my pants. I hate perverts. She retorted. Many men around the elemental nation sneezed at the comment. Anyway we're getting off track. The Chunin turned to Yuga. You said that it was a volunteer duty. Does that mean it isn't anymore? Kurenai wanted to know why a kid had someone watching his every move even if he was special. Yuga let out a sigh, as she explained. When he was younger, he was constantly pranking people around the village, but someone was always able to catch him. That all changed when he threw away his orange jumpsuit and wore shinobi clothing. Ever since then, he has been virtually undetectable and began pulling pranks without ever getting caught. To make matters worse, whenever he pulled a prank, there wouldn't be any evidence left behind. 
Without evidence, he couldn't be accused of any accusations. The people in Anbu, me included, didn't believe that he was untraceable. We believed that the Chunin and Jonin were getting lax or that everything was just baseless rumors. That was until he pranked the Anbu headquarters. Dot, she said, as the other two women gasped. Kuro and I couldn't believe Yuga's story. The Anbu headquarters is supposed to have the tightest defense in all of Kanoha. It's impossible to get in and out without someone knowing. Not to mention the fact that other than Anbu, no one knows where it's located. Kuro and I stated. Despite several years of service, as a Kanoha Kinoichi, she hadn't the slightest of an idea where Anbu HQ was located. It was impossible, but Naruto managed to find it. For his prank, he poured itch powder on our Anbu and training clothes. For good measure, he added itch powder to the detergent in case we tried to wash the itch powder out. Our masks were hidden in different areas, and when we found the mask, it was usually booby-trapped. Some had bright colored paint sprayed all over them with glitter sprinkled in, while others had syrup dumped on them and were covered with feathers. When we told Hokage-sama, he simply chuckled at our misfortune. In the end, we were punished for allowing a single civilian to come in and out of headquarters without being detected. Every Anbu was given gate duty for 24 hours without pay. Izumo and Katetsu were quite happy to be relieved of their duties. After that fiasco, the volunteer duty became a mandatory duty for all members. Despite someone constantly keeping an eye on him, he always seemed to be able to slip away. Yuga finished, as she remembered the wretched gate duty. Kuro and I was unsure of what to say. And this kid, who was able to hide from the highly trained Anbu, is somehow still an academy student. The Jinjutsu mistress questioned. He's currently in the bottom four of his graduating class. Yuga told them nonchalantly. This shocked Kuro and I, and Anko, who almost choked on a piece of dango. How's that possible? I expected him to be near the top of the class. Enko commented after drinking some sake to soothe the pain of almost choking to death. Yuga smirked at the girl's reactions. He was actually in the middle of his class before he suddenly plummeted. When I asked him the reason, he told me, before you can fool your enemies, you must be able to fool your allies. Enko grinned brightly. I, the great Mirashi Enko, taught him that deception was vital to a ninja, and he obviously took it to heart. She boasted while puffing out her chest proudly, ignoring the fact both Ibiki and Inoichi also advised the boy. Disregarding Anko, Yugao continued to explain why Naruto has not graduated yet to Kurunai. Naruto has Anbu level stealth, trapping, and possibly espionage skills. His high level of intelligence and creativity makes him a tricky opponent. His stamina chakra level is that of a low chunin, but I expect him to have jonin levels when he graduates. Naruto has a great mastery over the Kawurumi no Jutsu, Henge no Jutsu, Kakurumi no no Jutsu, and Nawanuk no Jutsu. He's able to use the last three without hand addition, he's a level 2 Fuenjutsu user, and will most likely be level 3 in a few months. Yuga informed me. Those skills alone make him worthy enough to be a genin. I still don't see why he hasn't graduated early. Kurina commented, but the purple-haired Anbu shook her head. That's where the praise ends, as other physical abilities, besides stamina, are still that of an academy student. Years of nutrition deficiency doesn't correct itself that quickly, even with his condition. His Jinjutsu and Tajutsu are non-existent at the moment. Naruto has only recently started Kenjutsu training with Heid, and sometimes me. He also isn't able to perform the Bunshin no Jutsu, which is one of the requirements needed to pass the Genin exams. Yuga wrapped up her in-depth analysis of her little brother. I felt like I was the Hokage for a moment, with the way you reported Naruto's abilities. Kuro and I laughed softly before pondering on something Yuga had said. Do you think the reason he can't do Bunshin no Jutsu is because of his condition? It only requires a small amount of chakra after all. The Jinjutsu mistress wondered. Yuga sighed in her seat. Hey, and I deduced that as well when we started training him. We told him there was an elemental bunshin that he could learn, but he refused. The Kenjutsu user informed me. This time Inko spoke up, choosing to enjoy her dango rather than converse. Why did they refuse? If I was him, I would have pounced on the idea of learning elemental bunshins. Especially if it allows me to avoid failing. The snake user reasoned. Yuga's expression turned sullen. The reason is because of a promise with his former teacher. He promised her that he would master lower rank before going for higher ranked. Naruto told me that he would rather use a low rank to full power than a high rank to half the power. Yuga said, recalling the conversation that she had with Naruto. Kuro and I could see the reasoning behind it, but he was doing more harm than good. Enko frowned at the former teacher since it reminded her of a certain snake. Who was his former teacher? She must have been someone incredible for him to respect her so much. The Jinjutsu mistress inquired. It was the late Makoto-sama. Yuga replied, as she began wondering if she had the right to talk about Naruto's past with her friends. Sure they had gotten close in the past few weeks, but he told her his past in confidence. Kuro and I was shocked, and easily saw why the blonde persisted with Bunshin Jutsu. If Naruto gave up, it would be like breaking one of the few bonds he had left of her. The booth was silent even though the rest of the store was loud and rowdy. Please don't tell this to anyone. I shouldn't have told you without asking Naruto for permission. 
Yu Gao pleaded to her friends. They nodded at the request. If it helps, why not tell him to make as much bunshin as possible instead of the required three? It should be easier since you won't be limiting the amount of chakra he uses. Kurenai suggested. Yuga nodded, and said that she'll tell Naruto the next time she sees him. The three ladies continued to talk about different topics well into the night. With Naruto when he left Angor. As Naruto arrived at the Hokage Tower, he was greeted with craters on the floors and walls. The Anbu were on the floor knockout while the secretary was shriveling behind her chair. He raced past her, hoping his grandfather was safe from whomever that attacked. The boy busted the door open to see Jiraiya and Hiruzen holding down a blonde lady. The black-haired lady holding a pig was off to the side, away from the men. Hokage-sama, are you alright? Naruto asked even though he could see the situation was under control. Oh yes, I'm fine Naruto-kun. Please come in and close the door. The Hokage smiled at Naruto's formal way of addressing him. The blonde boy did as told and watched as the two men slowly got off the blonde woman. Upon release, she gingerly stood up and looked into the direction of Naruto. Her blonde hair was tied loosely into two ponytails, while her forehead had a unique diamond-shaped mark. Both her grey kimono and the green hiori, which she wore over the kimono, was in a disheveled state as she walked to the fellow blonde. Naruto's eyes were drawn to the blue gem necklace around the woman's neck. Looking up at her eyes, he saw a mixture of emotions swirling in them. But the most prominent was that of remembrance. Have I seen this woman before? Only Jiji gives me that look when I visit, like he's seeing someone else in me. Naruto missed before calling his parents. She must have known my parents. He concluded. Naruto, I want you to listen to me. Hiruzen spoke, drawing the boy's attention away from the woman. The person in front of you is Tsunade of the Sanin, and also your godmother. Before you get mad at her, she didn't know that you existed until today. Jiraiya, and I hid the truth from her because she wasn't in the right minsa to care for you. Hiruzen explained while nursing the bruises he got from his female student. You didn't know I existed. Naruto asked calmly. Tsunade shook her head no. You were presumed dead along with your parents. I figured that you died since my sensei would have told me if you were alive. At least I thought he would have told me. She scoffed out the last sentence. His godmother sat down on the floor in front of him. Anyways I should introduce myself. My name is Senju Tsunade, one of the three legendary Sanin, and the last of the Senju clan. I'm known as the best medic in the world. She said, hoping to give a good impression. Home is also known as the legendary sucker, as she's the worst gambler in the world. Jiraiya butted in. Nobody asked you. Tsunade rebuked her teammate. Clearing her throat, she turned back to her grandson. Now tell me a little about yourself. Naruto sat down on the floor, as well. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, the village pariah, and one of the few Uzumaki in the world. My dreams are to one day become Hokage, and to keep all of my promises. In my spare time, I like to pull pranks, train, and read books. Naruto started out softly but grew louder, as he finished. A second later, the black-haired lady sat down next to them. Hello Naruto-kun, my name is Shizun, and this is Tauntin. Shizun introduced herself. She was wearing a long bluish-black kimono that was held together by a white sash. Tauntin had a dark red jacket and a necklace of pearls. Yuhi. Tauntin called happily as she stepped to Naruto. The blonde boy petted the pink pig, ruining another. I hope I didn't interrupt. I wanted to introduce myself since I'm Tsunade Sama's apprentice. The black-haired medic nin apologized. It's okay, Shizun san. I was wondering who you were. Naruto admitted. Please don't call me san, it makes me feel older than I actually am. Shizun sighed as she told the blonde. What shall I call you then? Naruto asked, which made Shizun put a finger to her chin. How about Shizun Nijin? I've always wanted a little brother. Shizun remarked. Naruto's smile increased. Hi Shizun Nijin, what should I call you godmother? He said while addressing Tsunade. Hmm, how about calling me Tsunade-chan? She suggested, which made Naruto look at her weird. He remembered reading that she was Jiraiya's teammate. Aren't you as old as Jiraiya? He inquired, adding a tick mark to Tsunade's forehead. How come you look so pretty? Naruto asked, unknowingly saving himself from pain. Tsunade smiled warmly at the younger blonde's question. What you see is an advanced form of Henge no Jutsu loan with a small Jinjutsu. Tsunade explained. Naruto wanted to learn the technique as well, but remembered that he had no experience with Jinjutsu. Plus he still needed to find a way to perform the Bunshin no Jutsu. Can I just call you Tsunade Bachin since it's easier for me? He questioned. The question earned him a light punch to his head from Tsunade. She nodded, nonetheless, to appease her godson. The three continued to chat, ignoring the two men in the room. Looks like we're being ignored sensei. Jiraiya voiced his sensei. Hears and smiled at the scene in his office. It's fine, I like seeing them like this. Sandame replied. Jiraiya wished that he was a part of the group, but he knew that Naruto didn't forgive him yet. Did you hear his introduction as one of the last Uzumaki? Hears and whispered to his student do you think he knows about his heritage? Nah, he probably read about his clan in some history book. Jiraiya presumed, which the Hokage nodded. Sorry to interrupt Naruto-kun, but can you take Shizun on a tour around the village? 
It's been quite some time since she's been in the village. I also need to talk to Tsunade about something. Here is an Asta young. Naruto noticed that it must have been important, so he got up to leave with the black-haired medic. He was stopped when Tsunade hugged him. He looks like a mini Minato, but he seems to have the personalities of both his parents. Tsunade thought, as a few tears developed. She quickly wiped them away. He hugged Tsunade back before waving his goodbyes, leaving with Shizun and Tauntin. As soon as they left, Hiruzen ordered an Angu to take his comrades to the hospital. I really don't want to talk to you right now sensei. I'm tired, and need some rest. Tsunade complained to the Sandame. Tsunade, I need you to stay because it's of utmost importance. I wouldn't have called you back like this if it wasn't. I also intend to keep my promise regarding the medical program, and your debts. However, that talk is for another day. Hiruzen replied, summoning another Angu. Summon dog and links to my office immediately, and I want the entryway to be cleaned up. He ordered. The Anbu nodded before leaving to perform his duties. A few seconds later, Dog and Lynx appeared in the room. You called Hokage-sama. The Anbu with gravity bending silver hair asked. Here's a nodded to Dog and then to Jiraiya. The Toad Sage surveyed the room before activating his privacy seals. The reason I called all of you is because my spies in route have informed me that Danzo is meeting with the Rachimaru early tomorrow in his underground base. The Sandame informed. Shock could be seen on Jiraiya's and Tsunade's faces. Dog and Lynx were also surprised at the news, but their masks covered their expressions. Sensei, do you know why they're meeting up? Jiraiya asked before curiosity got the better of him. More importantly, how were you able to get a spy en route? Danzo has everybody in his control because of the cursed seal on their tongues. If anyone with the seal tried to reveal root secrets or Danzo's involvement, they would die. The Toad Sage inquired. Jiraiya tried to find a way to negate the seal, but the men died before he had the time to study the seal. Hirazin chuckled at his student's confusion. You're correct that a person with the seal cannot say anything, but what if someone was capable of transferring his mind into a body without the seal? The Hokage asked. Sudden realization struck the people in the room. Of course. Yamanaka would be able to divulge the information to you, while also being able to spy on Danzo. The seal master said in disbelief. Jiraiya couldn't believe he didn't realize such a simple bypass. Regardless, the reason that they're meeting up is unknown at the moment. The reason I called each of you here is because we're to kill Danzo and Arachimaru for treason. I'll handle Danzo while Jiraiya will take on Arachimaru. Lynx, you will lead us to the base and direct us to Danzo. You'll then pair up with Dog to take down any root members. I would have liked for you to spare them since they're simply following orders, but I know that they would come at you with the intent to kill. Retaliate in kind and make sure to flee if you're being overwhelmed. My spies will help when they see the opportunity. Sunade, you'll stay here and get the hospital ready for us. During that time, you'll also be serving acting Hokage. Should something happen to me, you'll be my successor. Hiruzen explained his plan to the group. Tsunade wasn't happy with the plan. Why am I staying behind while you go off to battle? Sensei I'm not a little girl that needs to be protected, I'm one of the Sanin. She said defiantly. Tsunade didn't like the idea of them going in without a medic. Tsunade, will you correct in saying you're a Sanin, how long has it been since you actually fought? Her sensei questioned. Forget fighting, how long has it been since you've trained? As a medic, you know that senses are dull when not actively used. I've been training rigorously for over three months to get back in fighting shape, and I know Danzo has always remained in shape even after the war. Arachimaru and Jiraiya constantly honed their bodies during their travels around the elemental nations. Let us not forget that you've developed a fear of blood since the end of the war. The Sandame said, watching her winch. As much of a help you can be, you can quickly become a liability the minute you catch sight of blood. You might think I'm being cruel to you, but you must face the facts. I want to correct my mistakes while not making any new ones. I'm not going to my death. I still have to see my grandsons become shinobi before I can happily pass away. Hiruzen smiled kindly, which instantly relaxed the people in the room. Alright sensei. I understand your reasoning. Tsunade yielded. While she was unhappy, the blonde medic understood that she was a potential liability out in the field. I want you guys to come back safe. As long as you come back, then I'll do whatever it takes to heal you. The medic assured me. The men were grateful that the world's best medic was at their service. Make sure you come back sensei, I don't want to be stuck, as Hokage. Tsunade said bitterly. Hiruzen nodded, knowing that she was still haunted by the demons of her past. Get your supplies ready, and meet up at my estate in exactly one hour. We'll plan out our attack, and rest before heading off to Root Headquarters. Hiruzen ordered. The men did exactly, as told, and quickly left to pack their gear. The fight would be extremely difficult even with the element of surprise. Now Hiruzen simply had to wait for the day to end. When the next day arrived, he would make sure of his former rival. Next day, early morning hours, four figures made their way towards Training Ground 44 or by its more popular name, Forest of Death. Everyone was in their typical battle outfits, while Hiruzen had on his old shinobi outfit. Lynx led them to one of the many entrances into Route. 
Lynx removed the Jinjutsu that covered the ground to reveal a metal latch. Jiraiya checked for any seals while Dog checked for traps. After disabling all they could find, the group made their way into the headquarters and navigated through the tunnels. They arrived at a clearing where Shimura Danzo stood. What a surprise to see the Hokage here. How are you on this fair night in Hirzen? Danzo asked but was frowning that his rival was in his secret base. The root leader had wrappings covering his right eye and parts of his shaggy black hair. The man had on a white tunic underneath his black robe. No wonder the snake left so quickly. Shimura Danzo, based on reports of child kidnapping and associating with a known traitor, you're hereby sentenced to death. This sentence will be effective immediately. The Sandain caught the chatter as he got into his battle stance. Suddenly 100 root anbu erupted from the shadows and surrounded the intruders. Deal with the Togolongs. I'll personally deal with Hiruzen. Danzo ordered. Yuria goes after Rajmer. The rest of you stick to the plan. Hiruzen ordered his men as well. Dog and Link stashed back to the entrance to get to another clearing, while Jureya pursued after Rajmer. The Toad Sage vanished before the Rude Anbu were able to intervene. The members went after Dog and Lynx, leaving the two war veterans alone. Dog and Lynx vs 100 Rude Anbu. Dog and Lynx raced back to the entrance and activated the exploding tags that they placed as they fled. Bombs went off and the tunnel collapsed onto itself. Every Rude member survived and quickly surrounded the two intruders. Mokujin. Kaida no Jutsu would release. Trilim technique. Lynx sprouted three limbs, helping to capture or impale the root members. 25 members fired off a specific fire. Caden. And then, fire release. Fireball. They shouted together. They merged together, forming one huge fireball. The fireball turned the wood into ash, and continued to head towards Lynx. Sujin. Sujin Haki, water release. Water encampment wall. Dog announced, as soon as he was near Lynx. Dog surrounded the duo, and were barely able to withstand the attack. They heard a roar, and turned around to see a Doryuden, Earth Dragon projectile, coming at them. Dog and Lynx were able to successfully dodge the attacks. They were entirely on the defensive, and the enemy wasn't letting up. Raiden. Jibachi, lightning release. Electromagnetic murder. The root Anbu fired. Bolts of electricity came from every direction, and neither Kanoha Anbu had enough time to form seals for a Mashi came no jutsu, insect jar technique. A stoic voice called out. Insects surrounded the two Kanoha Anbu, and protected them from harm. After the technique died down, two young root members stood next to Dog and Lynx. It took you too long enough. Dog said rather lazily, even though he was still surrounded. It was rather difficult to apply while everyone was moving around. However, you were able to buy enough time for me to infect everyone. A boy with a stoic voice replied to Dog. As if puppets with its strings cut, the other members of Root fell to the floor in agony. Many bodies twitched before finally succumbing to the poison. The young root members took off their masks to reveal Yamanakafu and Aburam Torin. Torin fell down to one knee from chakra exhaustion. When the Hokage told us about the spies, I never expected you to be so young. Lynx voiced his opinion. When we were asked to join Root by Danzo's request, the Hokage gave us an espionage mission to discreetly spy on Danzo. Our abilities made it easy to access Root secrets. Fu explained. Torin stood upright and steadied his breathing. Even the most secure places have insects within them. That includes Root headquarters as well. I am able to talk to other insects which allowed me to spy on Danzo, even though I am not a senior member. Fu would then proceed to enter my mind with his clan techniques. When we went on missions, Fu would go into the mind of a random civilian, and relay the information to Hokage-sama. The job you too, but you have new orders from Hokage-sama. You'll lead me to where the kidnapped kids are located. You'll then flee with them, and be treated at the hospital. This was originally Lynx's orders, but that changed when we collapsed the tunnel. Lynx, go assist Hokage-sama immediately. Dog relayed his orders. Lynx merged into the ground and quickly disappeared from the others. Follow me Dog-san. Fu said, and the trio left, leaving behind the bodies of 98 dead root Andu. Garrison vs Danso. Garrison it seems you've grown a backbone after all these years. I have to ask, what brought about this sudden change? Danzo spoke calmly. I changed when you ordered the Chiha massacre despite my wishes. Now enough talk, today I shall bring your life to an end. Garrison spat out before throwing five shurikens. Shuriken cage bunch and no jutsu. Instantly the five shurikens multiplied to 25, and flew towards Danzo. Futin. Tatapa, wind release. Great breakthrough. Danzo released a current of wind that blasted the shurikens aside. Gerizen, hoping to capitalize on the wind, released a fire. Kaden. Ryuka no jutsu, fire release. Dragon fire technique. The stream of fire grew in size due to the wind. Danzo was barely able to escape to his left, but was able to burn the bandages on the right side of his face. There, in Danzo's right eye socket, was the shuringen. Danzo, how do you have Shuringen? Sande masked before drawing his own conclusions. Who did you kill to steal that? Kirzen was furious at how low his one-time teammate went in order to obtain power. 
I acquired the side before the Ichiha massacre. It was from a powerful shinobi, too bad he escaped before I could take his other eye. Danzo informed nonchalantly. Hiruzen's eyes widened in realization. Shisui's body was never found when he had committed suicide. Danzo you scum, what made you this power hungry? The Hokage said in disgust. I thought you loved the leaf, yet you took an eye of one of our shinobi. Hiruzen was sickened by the man. Danzo laughed at Hiruzen. The laughter soon became maniacal before ceasing. I love Kanahagakur, but I believe we belong at the top. Your pacifist ideals make the other hidden villages look at us, as if we're weak. That's why I should be Hokage. Under my direction, Kanoha would rise over those pathetic weaklings. Danzo replied. That doesn't justify your actions. We're Kanoha shinobi who bear the will of fire. Our job is to mentor the next generation to someday replace ours, not for them to be used as mindless tools. The Hokage refuted. Hiruzen was beyond disgusting by this human, not this demon. Shinobis are tools that are meant to be used by their superiors. What's wrong with me using the tools to make me stronger? If I'm stronger than Kanoha, it's as simple as that. Danzo said, as if it was the most obvious thing. The conversation ended with that, as both men went through hand seals. Danzo finished first, and released him. Fyurten. Shinkyuha, wind release. Vacuum wave. Danzo releases arcs of cutting wind at Hiruzen's location. Hiruzen slammed his foot into the ground. Doten. Doryuhiki, earth release. Earth style wall. A slab of rock rose in front of the sanding. The rock wall was overwhelmed by the wind attack, and was sliced to pieces. This, however, gave Hiruzen enough time to dodge, and slam his palm onto the ground. Kuchu snow jutsu, summoning technique. Out of the smoke came Hiruzen summon, King Enma. Not to be outdone, Danzo summoned his own summoning animal. A giant baku rose from the smoke. Let's go to Enma, Henge. K-O-N-G-M-N-Y-O-I transformation. Adamantine staff. King Enma changed into a black staff, and was placed in Hiruzen's hands. Hiruzen charged, and swung his staff at a variety of angles. Danzo was able to dodge due to the Shuringen's abilities. Eventually the Sandame relentless assault was able to hit Danzo across the neck, making it snap. Danzo turned to smoke, and was replaced by a piece of rock from Hiruzen's Doryuhiki. He used Kawurimi at the last possible second to replace himself with the rock. So that means he's currently behind me. The Hokage quickly thought. Danzo's summoning animal began sucking in the air. Hiruzen was placed between Danzo and his summon. Fyuten. Shinkyu Rampa, wind release. Vacuum successive waves. Blades of wind were aimed at Hiruzen. Shit. The Hokage cursed at his predicament, but was able to escape thanks to King Enma's quick thinking. The staff grew arms, and threw Hiruzen's body into the air. Hiruzen then initiated his own attack. Cage bunch and no jutsu. Two solid clones appeared midair beside the caster. The first clone began his attack, and was followed by the second. Sutin. Hanyu, what a release. Tearing torrent. Brayton. John, lightning release. False darkness. The first clone released a huge torrent of water from his mouth, while the second fired a lightning bolt from his hand at the torrent. Danzo stopped his attack, and tried to dodge when Trilins restrained him. Mokujin. Makusatsu Shibari no Jutsu, would release. Smothering binding technique. A voice came from underneath the ground. Unable to escape, Danzo met the attack head-on. The attack tore Danzo's body into shreds. The two bunchins, and Danzo's Baku puffed out of existence. This as Hiruzen landed, the kunai pierced through his heart. There stood an exhausted Danzo, with his Shuringen eye turned white. Just as Danzo smiled at his victory over his rival, he was struck through the chest. A staff had gone through him, and the Hiruzen in front of him turned to wood, revealing a Moku Bunshin, wood clone. Kino. When Danzo thought, as he remembered the former root operative, Hiruzen pulled out the staff, and Danzo fell to the ground. His life flickered in his eyes, as his body was too weak to move. There was no monologue or rant on being Hokage. His dream of making Kanahagakur stand above the other villages was gone. His quest was ultimately ended by the same man who took the Hokage seat from him. His eyes closed, and the life of Shinobi no Yami, the darkness of the Shinobi, was over. However unknown to everyone, Danzo gave Rachimaru an order using Kodamatsukami, the Chiha's strongest Jinjutsu. The order was to surgically implant Chiha's eyes along with the shot eye's DNA into Danzo's right arm. But just as the deal was done, Arachimaru fled with the eyes while promising the surgery another time. It was thanks to Hiruzen's intervention that the surgery didn't take place. In the Sandame Hokage's pursuit to end his rival, he had unknowingly given his former student more power. A month later, Hiruzen sat in his chair, and replayed what had happened in the past month. He was hospitalized for one week, as a precaution for minor injuries, and chakra exhaustion. The defeat of Danzo caused quite a few events to occur. Danzo's body was burned after it was announced that he was a traitor. Most didn't believe that such an esteemed elder could be a traitor, but when evidence of him collaborating with the Rachimaru came into light, there was no protest to the burning. Yureya was unable to track Rachimaru's slippery trail that seemed to disappear into thin air. Unable to find him in the darkness, the Toad Sage went back and reported to Hiruzen. 
The Hokage ordered a widespread search of possible tunnels or caves that could let out of the village. The shinobi were able to find several deserted labs, but none of them led outside the village. Yureya then left the village, hoping that his spy network would aid him in finding where the snake hid. Danzo's route was secretly kept in operation, but this time under the guidance of Linkser Tenzo, who was named route commander. All route shinobis that were loyal to Danzo were met with death for treason. The others surrendered, and were admitted into T&I documents regarding Root's activities were collected for Hirzen to review. It was amazing that Danzo had put his plans and dealings on paper. Some of the stuff the man had done was frightening. It clearly showed how much he strayed from the right path. His involvement with Hanzo the Salamander to quell Megagur's rebellion forces, in hopes that Hanzo would help him invade Kanahagagur, so Danzo could be Hokage. He gathered young children to be put in his program. He would even kill the parents if the child had potential to be used as a weapon. Danzo even made children kill each other to get rid of their so-called useless emotions. He attempted to kill Shisui to steal his Sharingan, but he was only able to steal an eye before Shisui escaped. That explained the real reason why Shisui had committed suicide. In addition, there was a roster of every root Andu. Even the ones that were killed were listed. Hirzen checked the list, and matched it with his own roster of shinobi. The Sandame wanted to ensure that no Danzo loyal root Andu was alive. He stripped the ones that were killed in action, as they weren't necessary to check. Danzo's papers even revealed how the other elders and some civilian council members were persuaded to join his side. This caused Hirazin to strip those council members of their seats on the council and place them in Tiandai for questioning. Kahari and Himura were asked to retire because if the villagers knew that the three elders were involved in traitorous actions, the villagers wouldn't trust the higher ups. The two ex elders regretfully retired from their posts, and Hirazin was forced to select new elders. He decided on his two loyal students, Jiraiya and Sunade. Jiraiya would only be available for council meetings if it was deemed important. Sunade was chosen because Hirazin wanted to groom her to be the next Hokage, not that she knew that. Although he didn't want to remain Hokage, he knew he had to teach Sunade everything that was needed to become Hokage before he retired. The younger kids in route were taken into an orphanage and were adopted by the villagers. Two of the kids requested to live with each other instead of with a guardian. Hirazin didn't like the idea of having kids live by themselves. He was going to dismiss the request when his surrogate grandson barged in. Flashback begins, Naruto had barged into the Hokage's office when he heard that the old man was hospitalized. Jiji, are you okay? Naruto asked, ignoring the fact that Hiruzen was with the company. As you can see Naruto-kun, I'm in good health. I wish that you would have not because, as you can see, I have company. Hiruzen said while chuckling at his grandson's antics. Naruto looked at the two boys that looked around his age. The one that seemed older had blue hair while the younger one had black hair. Both boys seemed awfully pale. Oh sorry about that Jiji, I was just worried about you. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sheepishly in embarrassment. The blonde boy sat down on the couch so he wouldn't disturb the two guests while he waited. The two guests, seeing that Naruto wasn't leaving, continued the conversation with the Hokage. Hokage-sama, can you please allow us to live together? The blue-haired boy asked hopefully. Sai is like a little brother to me, and I don't want us to be separated if one of us gets adopted. The blue-haired boy explained. The black-haired boy named Sai nodded his head in agreement. Hears and sighed out loud. He honestly didn't want to separate the two boys, but living without an adult was hard for children that were still in the academy. I'm sorry Shinkan, but it's difficult to live without a caretaker. Finding a place to rent you an apartment would also be quite difficult. The Sandame informed. Before the blue-haired boy called Shin could respond, Naruto cut into the conversation. Jiji, they could live in my building since no one else lives there besides me. The young man commented. The two boys looked at Naruto, as if he was the savior to their problems. Naruto began pressing Hiruzen even more. Plus, they'll have an orphan stipend until they graduate from the academy, which should be more than enough to live by. I really hope you don't separate your family just because they don't have an adult to take care of them. Look at me, I've turned out just fine even with my circumstances. Naruto stressed the word circumstances, hoping to guilt trip the old man. Naruto's plan worked, as Hiruzen felt remorseful for not taking care of Naruto better. The Hokage took a puff from his pipe before blowing it out. Fine, you'll have your wish. Sandame said. The two boys looked at each other, and smiled. But you'll need to parent, and attend the academy to become a shinobi. Hirazen smiled, as he thought the conditions were too lenient, but he didn't feel like facing Naruto's wrath. Flashback ends, it was later reported that Shin had a life-threatening medical condition. Normal doctors were unable to pinpoint the reason for his disease, and a way to cure it. Luckily, Sunade wasn't a normal doctor, and had seen such a disease in her travels. She was able to successfully cure him, and he no longer had to worry about dying from the disease. The medic program that Hirazen had installed at the hospital not only helped the academy students, but the doctors as well. The doctors were better equipped to handle more difficult injuries and diseases thanks to Tsunade's guidance. The students were taught different medical techniques like how to use a first aid kit. 
Simple things that could help a wounded shinobi were taught. Tsunade refused to teach medical ninjutsu to the students because it required good chakra control. She also believed that they needed to be at least genin for them to be worth her time. Harrison agreed, as chakra control was something their jonin sensei was supposed to teach them. Harrison spun his chair around to face the picture of Minato. I hope I'm doing you proud Minato. I'm slowly but surely fixing my mistakes. Hopefully I can take care of my greatest mistake before I pass on. The evening sun shone on Harrison's rock face on the Hokage monument. Harrison smiled, as if Minato had asked the heavens to give Harrison an answer. Two years later, Naruto sat on the swing, as he watched students walk out of the academy to their parents with their aid. Of course, Naruto didn't receive his hate like the others. After all, he was taking the genin exams next year. The blonde was actually waiting for Shin and Tenten to come out. Sai, wearing all black shinobi clothing, was sitting next to him on his own swing. He had gotten close to his neighbors, and they were like a family. Shin was the oldest, Naruto in the middle, and Sai the youngest. When they first met, Shin was like Naruto in some ways. Both were hyperactive and loud, but Shin was more absent-minded than Naruto was. Shin would sometimes stumble into things because he would be thinking about other stuff. Sai was the reserved one of the trio. He preferred to draw or read books. He and Naruto shared a common interest when it came to books. Sai was very impressionable, due to the fact that he would take anything a book would say, as advice. He had once read a book on nicknames, which stated that giving people nicknames was a sign of friendship. That next day, Sai gave everyone in class a nickname based on their appearances and personality. Naruto had to stop Sai's frankness because he kept saying mean things unintentionally. The blonde had to give his younger brother a book on manners to stop him. Sai apologized, but the damage was already done. Now everyone saw Sasuke's hair as a duck's butt. Strangely enough, Sasuke's fan club seemed to increase after the incident. Sakura now took out a wrath on Sai, instead of Naruto, after Sai had called her Howler Monkey. Only Sai would dodge her attempts, and they would hit whatever was near Sai instead. She was scolded by Ruka after she broke too many chairs. Naruto's affections for the pink-haired girl had decreased due to the fact that he was constantly training. Most of his time was used to hone his skills or to pull pranks. After a while, he no longer saw Sakura as anything more than a classmate. He attributed his liking of Sakura to the fact that he thought of Sasuke as a rival. The blonde still considered Sasuke as a rival, but he didn't vocally voice it. He tried to befriend the raven-haired boy like he promised Makoto. Despite multiple attempts to strike up a conversation, Sasuke would only reply with grunts. They really wanted to be friends with Ichiha, since they both understood what it was like to lose a family. Makoto and Itachi were as much of a family for Naruto as they were for Sasuke. He eventually gave the raven-haired boy space, after Sasuke said that he refused to associate with a loser like Naruto. While disheartened by the Ichiha's comment, Naruto didn't mind, as he had a group of friends. Shikamaru would invite him, and by extension Shin and Sai, to dinner at Nara compound. Yoshino quickly warmed up to the two boys, and constantly doted on them like she did with Naruto. At first, they loved the attention since neither had a mother. But before long they understood that Yoshino's affection was troublesome. Naruto was now able to beat Shikamaru and Shogi, but still lost 4 out of 5 times. Shin was too impatient for the game, while Sai preferred to draw. The blonde felt confident enough to challenge Shikaku, only to be beaten to the ground in a few moves. The Nara air smirked, as he knew his dad was a difficult opponent. Ino and Chaoji would often come over to play, as well. Chaoji was quick to open up to Shin, and said after he saw that Shikamaru had done the same. Naruto's and Chaoji's eating contests were constantly going back and forth with the Akamichi currently in the lead. Naruto started to train with the big bone boy at Shikamaru's request. The Nara air figured that this generation of Ino Shikacho would likely be placed on the same team. Shikamaru wanted the plump boy to get stronger, so that he could do less work. They knew that Shikamaru just wanted to make sure Chaoji could handle himself in a fight. Ino, on the other hand, didn't like Sai at all. After Sai had called her blonde howler monkey, she was displeased that she was compared to Sakura. The two girls would constantly fight or scream at Sai, much to the annoyance of the class. The pale boy ignored them while smirking, making Naruto swear his little brother was sadistic. Ino were on much friendlier terms with Naruto and Shin. She was still the co-president of the ever-growing Sasuke fan club though. Hinata had become more outgoing, and she stuttered less. The Hayuga female started to gain confidence from sparring with Naruto. The blonde finally asked why she constantly stalked him every day. She fainted on the spot, as Sai came to get Naruto for dinner. She was nicknamed Klaza pervert courtesy of Sai after the event. Naruto, hoping to not hurt her feelings, told her they were just friends, and that he didn't plan on being in a relationship anytime soon. Hinata was disheartened but settled with being a friend. The Hayuga heiress hoped to get stronger to impress both her father and Naruto. Kiba and Akamaru were a strange case of friendship for the blind. Akamaru would actively greet Naruto and his friends and was rather close to Naruto. Kiba, on the other hand, refused to associate with for some reason. 
He later found out from Ino that Kiba had a crush on Hinata, but she only paid attention to Naruto. Kiba apparently wanted to be friends with Naruto, but his pride got in the way most of the time. Shino was Naruto's best friend of the entire group. Although he was great friends with Shikamaru, the Aburam boy understood him better. They were both disliked by most of the populace because of what they carried. Naruto was scored because of the Kaiubi, while Shino was stared at with disgust because he carried it in his body. The blonde would often visit the Aburam compound, and was generally accepted by the clan. Naruto even met Shino's childhood friend Torin, who had recently come back from a long-term mission. Tenten was Naruto's best female friend. They constantly spar and train together. Naruto taught her Fujinjutsu to incorporate her fighting style, while Tenten worked with Naruto on his Kenjutsu. She quickly became friends with Yuga after she found that the Anbu woman also loved weapons, although it was only swords. Tenten was ecstatic to meet her idol, Tsunade, but was extremely disappointed when she met the drunkard. From that point on, Tenten only admired Tsunade's beauty and skills as a Kanoichi. Naruto wanted to tell her about the Kaiubi, but was afraid how she would react. She was his first true friend, and he trusted Tenten. But unlike with Shino and Shikamaru, Tenten was directly affected by the actions of the Kaiubi. He didn't know until the brunette told him about her past. Kaiubi had killed her parents, leaving her an orphan. Kajia and Terra had adopted the girl afterwards. Naruto was scared that he would lose her when he revealed the truth. Meanwhile Naruto's skills were progressing at a nice pace. He had finally succeeded in using the bunch of no jutsu after receiving Yuga's advice. He made 70 clones, instead of the required 3, and they didn't come out deformed. The blonde boy was able to use his other without hand signs, after his older sister had pointed it out to him. Yuga told him about chakra memory, which was similar to muscle memory. After using one multiple times, the body was able to remember how much chakra was needed to activate the hand signs were a way to make the body learn faster, and to stabilize them. Generally only E and some D ranks were used without hand signs, since others packed more power. Naruto asked Yuga if it was possible to do one-handed signs. Yuga nodded, but stated that one must possess amazing chakra control. If the person had lousy control, they would fail to appear. Naruto had then began working on the leaf concentration exercise to increase his chakra control. Initially he loathes doing leaf concentration since it reminded him of the time that Aruka made him do it, as punishment. Eventually, the blonde was able to hold three leaves on his body for six hours. To make the exercise more difficult, he would run while applying chakra to make the leaves stick to him. He had asked Haid for a more advanced chakra control exercise, but his Kanjusu sensei said that those exercises were only available to those who were genin and above. Haid was cured of his coughing problem thanks to Tsunade's medical expertise. It was weird for a while for Naruto and other shinobi to not hear the man cough. Yugao became even more infatuated with his sensei, and at one point, he didn't see them for an entire week. Naruto's training in Keiji Ai Ryu was progressing thanks to the help of Heid and Shizun. Shizun taught him human anatomy, and where the pressure points were located. Using that knowledge, Heid instructed Naruto on how to strike those areas. Thanks to his constant training, Naruto's physical abilities were now comparable to most of his classmates. He had now possessed high Chunin stamina. His strength was near the lower half of his classmates, as his skill set didn't rely on strength. He wasn't exactly sure where he stacked up against his classmates since he never went all out. He did know that he was weaker than Shin, and slightly stronger than Sai when going at full strength. The three boys were often spared without holding back. They told him about the old Ru program, and Naruto remembered that he was also recruited by Danzo when he was younger. They were instructed by Hiruzen to not garner too much attention, since their skills were that of a high genin. When Naruto was ready for level 3 in Fujinjutsu training, he sought out Jiraiya for training. The Hokage told him that the Toad Sage had left on an important mission. Naruto sighed, and wished he had talked to Jirei earlier, even if his godfather was a pervert, and an ass that left him for 8 years. After all, his father and mother made him his godfather. He must have been important to at least one of them. Naruto hoped that his Jonin sensei would be able to teach him to jutsu, maybe even Jinjutsu, if his chakra control got better. Just as Naruto finished musing, Shin and Tenten walked out of the building. Shin was wearing all black Anbu clothing from top to bottom. Naruto had suggested outfit changes for both Sai and Shin, but they refused. They were used to wearing Anbu clothing because of their time in route. Shin's hit I-8 was wrapped tightly on his left bicep. Tenten wore a pink hip-out blouse as her top and dark green pants as her bottom. Her aid was tied to her forehead with the cloth being a darker shade of blue than her shinobi sandals. The quartet quickly left and went to Tenten's house for a celebration for the two new Kanoha ninja. Tenten hoped she had a cool sensei and team. Naruto already knew that Shin enlisted in the new Ru program, since he had many comrades there. The requirement for joining the Ru program was unknown since it technically didn't exist. Shin was allowed because he was a part of the old program. The new Ru ninjas were trained in espionage, and were usually on missions outside the village. 
This allowed the Anbu to concentrate their forces inside the village. The Anbu even served as backup members on difficult missions, or when a squad requested reinforcements. The program was only known to Chunin level, and higher shinobi. It was kept from public knowledge to ensure that there wouldn't be any backlash. Sai had wanted to join at the same time as Shin, but the oldest brother urged him to spend more time with his friends. Sai nodded, promising to join after he graduated. Naruto preferred not to join because he wanted to be Hokage. Since Rit mainly worked in the shadows, his mission records wouldn't be publicly known. There was no way the villagers would accept him as Hokage if they didn't know of his accomplishments. Plus he doubted that would enjoy staying away from the village, where most of his friends were. The families of the new graduates celebrated, as their kids had joined the ranks of Kanahagakur Shinobi. In another year, Naruto would also be a genin. Ten months later, Naruto was jogging around the village in the early morning hours when he spotted two silhouettes from a distance. As he got closer, he saw two males walking on their hands. It was hard to miss them due to the fact their outfit was green spandex. The only redeeming feature of the outfit was the orange leg warmers, at least according to Naruto. Luckily, someone else is exercising on this youthful morning. The older man beamed to his disciple. Yash, Kai-sensei. This person is worthy of becoming my rival. The younger version proclaimed to his sensei. Lee jumped from his position and landed in front of Naruto, stopping the blonde from moving forward. Hello my name is Rock Lee, may I have your name? Lee asked while he held out his hand. Uzumaki Naruto, nice to meet you Lee, but I need to finish my jog. Naruto shook Lee's hand, hoping to flee from the green spandex war. Lee's bushy eyebrows were sending chills down his spine. However, Kai stopped the blonde by placing a hand on Naruto's shoulder. Ah, you must be young Naruto, whom our Tenten talks about. It seems that you're a very hard worker just like she told us. Kai commented. Before Naruto said another word, Tenten came running up to the group. Kai sensei you're late for the team meeting, what are you doing? Tenten asked when she spotted Naruto. Naruto, what are you doing here? The brunette wondered. Naruto answered with his own question. These two are a part of your team. He said, pointing to Kai and Lee before continuing. I thought you said that your sensei and teammates were super cool. Kai and Lee smiled brightly, causing Naruto's eyes to flinch in pain. Did you hear that Lee? Our youthful Tenten told her friend that we're cool. I'm one step closer to beating my rival Kakashi in coolness now. Kai shouted out. Hi Kai sensei. I think the Tenten was embarrassed by our coolness, so she only told her friends. Lee added on. Lee. Kai sensei. Lee. Kai sensei. This image of two males in green spandex hugging each other with tears falling from their eyes was horrifying. Naruto had luckily closed his eyes because the sunset Jinjutsu soon came into effect. The early morning goers that saw the scene passed out with foam coming out of their mouth. Tenten simply cringed because she had seen the image many times, too many by her count. Naruto I hope you understand why I lied to you. She whispered. Naruto nodded and placed a hand on her shoulder. His eyes were full of pity and sadness for his friend. Tenten I'm sorry, I don't know how you can deal with them. Naruto replied, trying to console her while giving her a reassuring smile. I ended the Jinjutsu with Lee and turned to Naruto. Young Naruto-kun, how would you like to train with us today? Guy asked the blonde. They winced at the idea, not wanting to spend any more time with the spandex duo. Even though he's weird, Kai sensei is the best Sajutsu user in Kanoha. Tenten told him. Sure. The blonde replied, changing his mind. I was hoping someone could help me with my Tajutsu, as it's one of my weak areas. Naruto added. The quartet headed towards training ground 9 where a long black haired boy stood. The training ground was like training ground 11, except that it had dummies, and was littered with weapons. I keep telling Tenten to pick up her weapons after she's done with them, but she never listens. Naruto thought in his head. I sensei I wish you would inform me, and Tenten if you're going to be late. The boy said to Guy, annoyance evident in his tone. Naruto noticed that the boy oddly resembled Hinata. Most likely Hayuga, the boy wore a khaki shirt, and dark brown shorts. Bandages were wrapped around his right arm, and right leg. The blue shinobi sandals completed the outfit. That was unyouthful of me Niji, I'll be here on time from now on. If I'm not, I'll run a thousand laps around Kanoha on my hands. Guy announced, much to the disdain of the people nearby. Anyways, are we going to train? Niji inquired. I have clan matters I must attend to. The black-haired boy said even though he had no such thing. It was the only possible way to escape the spandex duo. He finally noticed the blonde standing next to Tenten. What's he doing here? I smiled at Niji's question. This is Naruto-kun, a friend of Tenten's, and an equally youthful person. Naruto-kun is my other student, Hayuga Niji. Kai introduced the two. Hello my name's Uzumaki Naruto, nice to meet you. Naruto greeted me. Niji frowned, and had a look of distaste. I see. You're the boy that is friends with Hinata-sama. The Hayuga male remembered. Naruto smiled, but Niji continued. No wonder. Trash tends to stick together. After all, fate dictates that they'll never amount to anything. Niji said, causing Naruto to fume. Hey, I don't care what you call me, but don't call my friends trash. They roared. 
I have every right to call you whatever I please. Fate separates the winners from the losers. You're fortunate that a talented Kanoichi like Tenten is even friends with you. A loser can only lick the ground where the winner stands. Niji finished his monologue. Tenten was furious at her teammate for downing her best friend. She was about to tell him off, but Lee intervened. Niji, in your eyes a loser will always be a loser, but with hard work anything can change. Lee advised. Niji smirked at the spandex war. Lee, you were the dead last of our graduating class, and you weren't able to mold chakra, yet you still persisted on being a shinobi. I'll admit that I no longer see you as trash, as your skills have grown since training with Gai Sensei. Niji admitted, causing Lee to smile at the acknowledgement. Niji would once again down his spears. You're now the ground under my feet instead of the trash that rolls around. Naruto was mad, no he was infuriated. Gai Sensei, can I spar with your student? The blonde requested, as he desperately tried to control himself. Naruto's mind was raging to thrash the disgusting human being in front of him. Tenten put a hand on his shoulder. You might be good for an academy student Naruto, but Niji was the rookie of the year. He's arguably the best of our generation. She warned. Naruto shrugged the hand off his shoulder and looked at Tenten, dead in the eye. Tenten, titles like rookie of the year don't matter out in the battlefield. I may be weak, but I'm not as weak as you think. The blonde refuted. Naruto turned away from her and stood opposite Niji. Tenten was stunned by Naruto's words. She always sparred with him so she knew how strong he was. Why didn't he understand that she was trying to protect him? Kai approached the two boys and stood in the middle. Naruto-kun I thank you for being civilized and requesting a spar against my student instead of outright attacking him. I bowed in gratitude before standing back up. This is a spar so there will be no killing blows. The spar ends when I say so or when your opponent surrenders. Kai explained the rules of the spar. This is your last chance to surrender before I pummeled you into the ground. Fate dictates that I'll emerge victorious. Niji smirked before getting into his Jukin stance. They chose not to comment and simply looked at Niji impassively. The outgoing Naruto was replaced as his serious side kicked in. Naruto was analyzing the male Hyuga like a book, trying to find a weakness to exploit. After deciding on a plan of attack, he unsealed his Wakizashi from his scroll. Lee waited with anticipation for the spar to start, even though he was still feeling down from Niji's comments. Tenten sighed in defeat and just hoped the two wouldn't hurt each other too much. Kai raised his hand up and after a tense moment dropped it. Naruto vs Niji. Niji and Naruto both stood there, waiting for the other to attack. Niji was obviously not taking this seriously, as he didn't even activate his Byakugan. Naruto decided to take the initiative and try to capitalize on the fact that he was being underestimated. Bushin no Jutsu. In an instant, hundreds of Naruto's filled the training area. Such a useless technique when faced with Byakugan. Niji activated his Dejutsu and scanned the area. However he was unable to find the real Naruto among the crowd. HMPH, he ran away, as soon as he had the chance. The Hyuga concluded. Naruto suddenly appeared in front of Niji, with his back to the Hyuga. The only person that saw what had happened was Gai. After making the numerous bunchins, Naruto used Kawarimi no Jutsu to replace himself with one of the abundant shuriken on the ground. The shuriken the blonde chose to replace himself with was more than 50 feet away. Gai concluded that Naruto had experience with fighting the Byakugan to know some of its limits. Naruto had then applied chakra to his feet and sprinted across to attack Niji. To knock Gai out of his thoughts, Naruto slid his wakizashi back into his sheath. Keiji Ayrayu. Mikazuki, Shadow Crook Draw Style. Crescent Moon. They whispered. When the blade was fully in the sheath, blood sprayed all over Niji's back. The crescent strike was etched into his back, and red liquid was dripping out of the wound. You shouldn't have underestimated me. If we were allowed to kill blows, you would be dead right now. Naruto said with no outward emotion. Tenten had never seen her friend like this before. Every time they spared, there was always a smile on his face. Is this how strong he really is? Tenten thought while observing the spar. Niji painted before gathering his breath. So even if a loser can injure me, I'll make sure you'll never hit me again. Hayuga arrogantly commented even though his back was dripping blood. Naruto put his hand up to activate a seal. Niji saw this, and noticed that there was a paper seal on his back thanks to Byakugan. Looks like you've noticed my seal on your back. Naruto said, as he smiled at Niji. Too bad you noticed it too late. You lose Niji. Naruto activated the seal, and light surrounded Niji. The male Hayuga was blinded by the sudden light, forcing him to deactivate his Dejutsu. Keiji Airai. Subum no Mir, Shadow Quick Draw Style. Swarm of Swallows. Naruto rapidly slashed Niji's body countless times. When the light dissipated, Naruto was slowly sheathing his blade while Niji stood there frozen. As soon as the Wakizashi returned to his scabbard, red liquid splattered into the air. Naruto bent down to face Niji, who had fallen to the ground. This so-called trash just defeated you. If what you said was true, then what are you now that you lost the trash? Your so-called fate didn't help you win even though you said it would. You said that fate dictates life, then why not change it? 
You didn't try to change it because you're a coward. You took the coward's way out and wallowed in self-pity and arrogance. The blonde said. Naruto got up and apologized to Guy for hurting his student before leaving the training ground. Niji laid there with his face on the ground, thinking about Naruto's words. Guy sat down next to his defeated student. Niji everyone here believed that you were strong, much stronger than Naruto-kun. Guy comforted the Hayuga. The only one who didn't believe that was Naruto-kun. He was able to beat you because you were arrogant and underestimated him. I hope you learned an important lesson today and think about the words that he told you. Guy said in a serious tone, unlike his usual exuberate self. Is it possible to change fate? He was obviously weaker than me yet he was able to win. I may not know if fate could be changed, but I'll at least try from now on. Niji thought, as he reached self-realization. Hi Guy sensei Niji said with a rare smile on his face. Yash. I'll also make Naruto Khan my eternal rival. Lee shouted at the top of his lungs. The spandex duo then carried Niji to the hospital, but not before telling the stunned Tenten that she had the rest of the day off. Guy also told her to tell Naruto that he was welcome to join in their training. Tenten nodded before running off to catch up to her best friend. The weapon mistress didn't need to run far, as Naruto soon came into view. Naruto, wait a minute. The brunette shouted, as she grabbed Naruto by the arm, stopping him from going any farther. Naruto's eyebrows arched up in confusion. What's up Tenten? Naruto asked his friend. What was all of that Naruto? I've never seen you move like that before. Tenten asked since every time they had sparred, Naruto never displayed such skills. Well, to be honest, I didn't want to attack the stick up the ass, Niji, like that. Naruto rubbed the back of his head in embarrassment. He made me so mad for insulting my friends. I don't care if he talks about me, I'm used to it. But when he talks about my friends, it's a different story. So I wanted to pummel him and make him regret it. Those attacks are mainly used to severely injure or kill my opponent. I would never use it against you. The blonde admitted to his friend. Tenten sighed for the second time today and came up to Naruto. Why is he always so selfless? He never thinks about himself. It's an admirable trait yet why does it feel so sad? Tenten thought as she wrapped her arms around Naruto. Naruto was surprised by the action, but he hugged her back. They stood there together for a brief moment until a booming voice rang throughout the village. Look I sensei. I told you Tenten embraced your teachings of youth. Lee shouted from a hospital window. Yes. Kai replied. You're right my student, youthful Tenten is just too shy to show it. Kai then flashed a nice guy pose towards Tenten and Naruto. Lee followed the action, and his teeth twinkled. The blonde and brunette blushed, and quickly separated from each other. A nurse came by, and told them to leave since they were disturbing the patients. Naruto and Tenten laughed, as the nurse chased Guy and Lee with a clipboard, ready to strike. Graduation day, two months later, Naruto sat there anxiously, as the rest of the class came into the room. Some were nervous while others just wanted to get the exams over with. Naruto waited his turn for the ninjutsu part of the exam. The boy answered enough questions on the written part to pass. He was able to pass the throwing test with ease. In the Tajutsu portion, Mizuki went up against Naruto. The blonde was able to win using a style that Guy taught him. Guy taught Naruto, as promised, and after seeing Naruto's horrible Tajutsu, was motivated even further. The blonde's Tajutsu was called Sufudo Tsubum, Swift Swallow. It was an original style inspired by Naruto's Tsubum no Muir attack. It was an evasive style that used Naruto's instincts and limber body to dodge attacks. The blonde would dodge or parry before attacking different areas of the body. The style fitted the to the T, since he knew the pressure points of the human body. It was thanks to Niji, however, that the style had come to form. After being discharged from the hospital, the Hayuga wasn't as pessimistic, nor did he belittle others like before. While he was still serious, Niji smiled more. When Guy asked Niji for advice, Naruto was sure that the Hayuga male would refuse, since the Juken was a clan technique. Instead, Niji instructed the blonde on how the Juken worked, and in return, Naruto would spar with Niji. The Hayuga teen wanted to see how the Juken stacked against a style similar to it. Naruto constantly had his points closed since Niji never went easy. Eventually Naruto was able to parry Niji's attacks, but still couldn't land a hit. The new style would take time to perfect since it was new. Niji acknowledged that Naruto might one day be an equal to him, and Lee in Tajutsu. When the blonde used the Sufu Tutsubum against Mizuki, it was the first time that he had ever landed a hit. This resulted in him sending Mizuki to the floor in pain. Mizuki was escorted to the hospital, as everyone looked on in shock. Sasuke was seething with jealousy, and demanded Naruto to teach him that style. Naruto refused since it was his own, and he wanted to perfect it before teaching anybody. Sasuke didn't say anything, as Naruto didn't outright refuse or accept to teach him. The Uchiha simply grunted, and went back to brooding. The ninjutsu portion was the last part, and it went in alphabetical order. Naruto was among the last in the room before his name was called. Alright Naruto, I need you to do the three basic academy justice. Iruka said. The two were the only ones in the room since Naruto had sent Mizuki to the hospital. 
Naruto used Kawarimi with a chair in the room and used Henge to turn into Uruka. He finished off the test with 50 bunshins. Uruka was beyond happy and congratulated Naruto before grabbing a hit I ate. Naruto, if you would let me, can I put your hate on you? Uruka asked his now ex student. Sure, Sensei, by all means. Naruto replied with a grin. Uruka bent down and replaced Naruto's goggles with the eight. When he finished, small tears formed from his eyes. He hugged the boy tightly before releasing. I always believed that you could do it, I'm so proud of you. Uruka smiled as he wiped away the tears. Naruto, this time, embraced his teacher. Thank you for not hating me like everybody else, Uruka sensei. I learned a lot from you, even though your lectures were boring. The blonde jokes. The two shared a quick laugh and promised to meet at Ichiraku's another time. Naruto met up with his friends, and they went to the Akamichi to celebrate their graduation. It was a festive day, and around nighttime, Naruto left the compound to talk to Sandane. He entered the room to find a limping Mizuki with a large scroll in his hands. Look at my luck. Just before I leave the village, I get to kill the demon brat. Mizuki grinned evilly while placing the forbidden scroll down. So you're a traitor Mizuki team. I always thought your smiles were fake. Let me ask you a question before you die, who are you working for, and why? Naruto asked but went into his tajutsu stance. Mizuki laughed hysterically at the boy. Who are you to ask me those questions? The traitor mocked. Since you're going to die anyway, I'll indulge in your last wish. I work for the greater Archimaru Sama, and he promised me power to match even the cages. Mizuki confessed to Naruto. There's no way you could do this alone. You're too stupid for that, who's helping you? The blonde inquired, trying to get Mizuki into revealing more information. I'm not stupid you fucking demon. The ex-teacher yelled. Wait, why are you so calm when I'm about to kill you? Mizuki's eyes narrowed in suspicion. Damn. I was hoping to get more information out of you. He's all yours Anbu-san. They called out. At Naruto's words, an Anbu appeared from the shadows and captured Mizuki with ninja wire. Mizuki didn't have time to react as the Hokage came into the room. Anbu, take the traitor to the Tiandai building and give me a report on all the findings. Hiruzen told the Anbu, who immediately left. Sandaim sat down in his chair and faced his surrogate grandson. Looks like you graduated Naruto-kun, congratulations on being a genin. The Hokage congratulated his newest genin. His face then warped into one of seriousness. The job on getting Mizuki to reveal information, but how did you know there was an Anbu nearby? He asked Naruto. Naruto gave a white grin. I just figured that there would be one nearby, since an Anbu usually follows me around. Luckily I guessed right, and Mizuki was apprehended without me lifting a finger. The blonde explained. Oh, I wouldn't be committing any more pranks so you can tell them to stop tailing me. The new genin added. Hairs and sweat dropped on the boy. Naruto knew about the Anbu tailing him, and the reason why they did. Ignoring that last sentence, you shouldn't have provoked an enemy shinobi. He warned. I'm pretty sure I could take on Mizuki, but I'll be more cautious next time. Naruto nodded, and thanked his grandfather for the advice. Anyways Naruto, you'll receive partial pay for a B-rank mission for your assistance in apprehending Mizuki. This won't go on your record, as you're not officially a genin until you see your jonin sensei. Here's a mix some truth with the lies to prevent Naruto from knowing about the official genin test. Okay Gigi. I just stopped by to tell you I graduated, but I see that you're going to be busy so I'll leave. Naruto said while saying his goodbyes to the Hokage. When Naruto left the room, an Anbu Shunshin entered the room. What's the status of Mizuki, Dragon? Hiruzen asked the Anbu commander. Mizuki has revealed everything after he was interrogated by Biki. Inoichi's mind walks into Mizuki to confirm that he's telling the truth. He has ties with a spy of Rachimaru, a Jenna named Yukushi Kabuto. Kabuto's currently working at the hospital. We've also found a hideout that lets out of Kanoha. Dragon finished his report. The Hokage recognized the name Kabuto and scanned Danzo's root roster. I want a team to capture Kabuto but proceed with caution. From Danzo's records, Kabuto was a former root Anbu, so he has at least Shunin skills. Take another team to investigate that hideout. The Hokage ordered. He had miscalculated, trusting in Danzo's papers. Hiruzen frowned that he allowed Imol to remain in Kanoha. Dragon nodded and left to gather the teams. Hiruzen lit his pipe with a small fire. How did Kabuto infiltrate Kanoha without anyone knowing? He even hid in broad daylight, yet no one suspected a thing. Is it possible that there's another traitor within our midst? The old man mused, as he was left alone with a stack of paperwork. A week later at an unknown location, I returned to Orochimaru Sama, Mizuki was captured by Kanahagakur. I was unable to assassinate him before he revealed your secrets. I wish for you to forgive me for this failure. Kabuto reported well bound. His ash gray hair was styled in a ponytail, while the shinobi wore a high collar purple shirt with matching pants. A flask was thrown across the room and impacted the wall next to Kabuto. I knew I should have killed that idiot when I had the chance. It'll be more difficult to infiltrate Kanoha now that Saratobi is on the lookout for us. Rachimaru raged and accidentally killed the specimen on the table. The Sandin's extremely pale skin glowed in the dark cave. 
The man's golden iris was able to strike fear in most beings. With purple markings around his eyes and fang-like teeth, it was appropriate to call him the Snake Sanin. Shit. I killed this fool. Rachimaru cursed, throwing the corpse to the side. This is unfortunate, but we'll need to push back our plans to invade Kanoha. The invasion will happen sometime after the Chunin exam. Go, and inform the Kazuki Age that the proposal is null because of complications. Also Kamimro, I have a mission for you. Arachimaru barked out orders before turning to an equally pale-skinned male. Two scarlet dots were marked on the male's forehead, proving him to be a member of the Kagaya clan. His white hair swooshed, as he bent down to his knee. Is there anything I can do for you Arachimaru sama Kamimro asked his savior. I've heard of an interesting rumor out in Sunagakur. Apparently there's someone with abilities to heal people if bitten. I want you to find that person, and bring them back here alive. They might be an interesting subject to test or a tool to heal my troops. Either way, take the sound 5 with you, and don't fail me Kamimro. The snake sand and ordered Kamimro. Of course Arachimaru sama your wish is my command. Kamimro said before walking off. Sir Tobi sensei your beloved Kanoha will fall to me, and on that day I will kill you. Arachimaru laughed, as he looked at the jars that contained the Chiha's eyes. At the same time in Kanoha, the academy graduates waited patiently for Ruka to come, and announce who would be their teammates. Unknown to them, the Hokage and several Jonins were watching them interact through a crystal. After a few short minutes, the Jonins backed up and waited for the Sandame to speak. You can now make your requests, if you have any. Hiruzen told the soon-to-be senseis. Three people raised their hands. Those Jonins were Sir Tobi Asuma, Hada Kakashi, and Yuhi Kurunai. I'll hear you out and decide whether to accept the request or not. The Hokage pointed to Kakashi first. I would like Ichiha Sasuke on my team, as I'm the only one capable of teaching him the Shuringen. Kakashi said with a nice smile. The former Anbu captain was once again late to the meeting, forcing everyone to wait for him. I would like to request Hayuga Hinata on my team for personal reasons Hokage-sama. Kurunai, the new Shonen, requested. I want this generation's Inoshikacho. Asuma smirked, as he ran a hand through his spiky black hair. The Sandame's son had just returned from his service, as a member of the Twelve Guardian Shinobi. His attire consisted of a standard blue jonin outfit. The main difference was that he had on a white sash with the kanji fire written in red, tied to his waist. He had a goatee similar to his father. The younger Saratobi was itching for a cigarette, but a quick glare from his former teammate, Kurunai, stopped him. Hiruzen pondered the request for a moment. Kakashi's right, as he's the only one able to help Sasuke. I should put Naruto on that team, and see if Kakashi recognizes his sensei's son. Kurunai could hopefully boost Hinata's confidence, and train her to be a respectful Kanoichi. Asuma, on the other hand, is just being lazy. He knows that it's tradition for a Tobi to be the sensei of each generation of Inoshikacho. The Sandame mused. Here's and scribbled names on a paper, detailing the teams, and sensei. He sent an Anbu to give the parchment to Uruka. He then gave all the Jonins a scroll with information on their team. All requests are approved, and you'll meet with your teams now. You're all dismissed except for Kakashi. The Hokage announced. As the Jonins funneled out of his room, Hiruzen turned to perpetually late Jonin. Kakashi, you've got to stop being late. I don't care what you do on your own time, but when it interferes with other people's time, we have a problem. Of course Hokage-sama. Kakashi replied, but the Sandame knew that the silver-haired male had already forgotten about the discussion. I didn't want to resort to this, but I need to make sure you're no longer late. The Hokage sighed before reaching into one of his cabinets. The old man pulled out a book with a red cover that depicted a man thinking about love. The book was autographed by the author, Jiraiya. That's the mega rare misprint of Ichiricha. Violence with Jiraiya Sama's signature on the cover. Kakashi shouted, his visible eye widening in disbelief. Only five copies were ever released because Jiraiya had accidentally sent the unfinished manuscript of the third book, instead of the completed second. It was rumored that Jiraiya had destroyed the copies to prevent anyone from knowing about the third book. The rumor turned out to be false since Hiruzen held one in his hand. As I've suspected, you know about the existence of this book. The Hokage said, as he gently laid down the book on his desk. It was common knowledge that Kakashi was an avid collector of Ichiricha. He had the entire collection bearing two. The book in front of him was one. The other was an exclusive book about a red-haired woman and a blonde male. This book could be yours. Kakashi's body jolted on the spot. He desperately wanted that book, but he knew that there was a catch. What do I need to do to obtain that masterpiece? Jonin asked. Hiruzen smiled, knowing that he won. You simply need to be on time for an entire year. That includes being on time for meetings, missions, and everything in between. The Sandame replied, causing the Jonin to nod. The Hokage glanced at the clock. Looks like you're going to be late to meet your team. He said nonchalantly, and Kakashi was gone, along with the book. Back at the academy, Iruka was quieting his class. The Jonins walked into the room to observe the prospective Jonins. Kakashi Shunshin entered the building, surprising everyone. The Jonins and Iruka were astonished that he was even there. The students were surprised to see someone appear suddenly. 
Kakashi made his way to the back, and Iruka continued where he left off. Okay I'll announce the teams, and you'll follow your Jamin sensei. Before I begin, I would like to announce that the rookie of the year is Ichiha Sasuke, while Haruno Sakura is our Kanoichi of the year. As Iruka finished, screams came from the girls, as they congratulated Sasuke. Naruto, and a few others congratulated Sakura, but she was too busy admiring the Ichiha. Iruka coughed loudly to get the attention once more. I want to say that I'm proud of all of you for making this far. If you work hard enough, you'll succeed at whatever you choose to do. Good luck on your career, Ashinobi. Alright team 1 is where Iruka announced the teams. Team 7 will consist of Haruno Sakura, Ichiha Sasuke, and Uzumaki Naruto, while your sensei is Hata Kakashi. Sasuke grunted in confirmation, but he didn't like his team. Great, I get Sakura the fangirl, and the dope. At least the fangirl's smart, and she's the Kanoichi of the year. There's some hope for her. The dope is going to drag me down with his idiocy. Although the tajutsu he showed was interesting. This sensei better be competent, and teach me everything I want to know. I need to get stronger to kill Itachi. Sasuke thought, as he ignored Sakura's proclamation of true love. The Ichiha's attire consisted of a high color blue shirt that had the Ichiha symbol on the back. White shorts and matching arm warmers completed the outfit. His aid was fastened on his forehead. Sakura had grown out her hair after a rumor had circulated, stating that Sasuke likes girls with long hair. Similar to Tenten, Sakura also wore a kippao although of a red variety. She wore tight green shorts underneath with green sandals to match. Her red bow was replaced with the eight. Naruto sighed, as he laid his head on the desk. The team isn't too bad, but those two don't particularly like me. Naruto sighed inwardly this time. The blonde wore a larger version of his old dark shinobi clothing. He had grown taller over the years, ranking in the middle of the class. The only change was that his 8 was worn comfortably where his goggles used to be. Iruka announced the next team. Team 8 will consist of Aburam Shino, Hayuga Hinata, and Inuzuka Kiba, with your sensei being Yuhi Kurunai. Shino and Hinata nodded, but both were disappointed that Naruto wasn't their teammate, albeit for different reasons. Kiba was all smiles, as he was on the team with his crush. The Inuzuka didn't particularly mind the presence of Shino. Shino sported a typical look of his clan with a high collar greenish jacket and dark shades. Burgundy shinobi pants finished the look. Shino's hit I-8 was also worn on his forehead. Hinata wore a conservative tan jacket with the symbols of the Hayuga clan on both arm sleeves. In addition she wore black shinobi pants and blue shinobi sandals. Her aid was underneath her jacket and hung loosely round her neck. Kiba's outfit remained the same as he still wore his grey jacket. The only addition was the aid on his forehead and his matching grey pants. Team 9 is still in rotation, so Team 10 will consist of Akamichi Chaoji, Narashikamaru, and Yamanaka Ino, with their sensei being Sirotobi Asuma. The boys smiled at each other, as Shikamaru knew this was going to happen. Ino groaned that she was chubby and lazy, instead of being with Sasuke. Benefiting his lazy nature, Shikamaru wore a simple grey jacket over a mesh shirt. His A laid loosely tied around his left arm, right underneath his clan symbol. He was given brown pants by Yoshino. In contrast, Chaoji had the most articles of clothing. On top he wore a white shirt, with the kanji food on it, underneath an unbuttoned green hiori. The long white scarf was fastened around his neck, and he wore black shorts. Both his arms and legs were wrapped in bandages. His hit I-8 was on a headgear that allowed Chaoji's brown hair to poke out. Ino wore a vest-like blouse, and skirt in her favorite color purple. The gap between the two pieces of clothing was filled with bandages with her aid on top. She also wore bandages underneath her skirt, and white arm warmers. All three wore silver hoop earrings. Sai has been selected to be an apprentice of Tenzo. Iruka announced, as a brown-haired man raised his hand. Although Naruto didn't know who the man was, he believed that Tenzo must have been a part of Root. The others looked at Sai, who wore the same outfit as Shin, wondering why he had been chosen. The Jonin senseis collected their teams, and left the room. Team 7 meets me at training ground 7 in 10 minutes. Kakashi said, as he disappeared in a puff of smoke. Naruto said his goodbyes to his friends, as he followed Sasuke and Sakura. Near the entrance of the training ground was a grass field with three wooden poles standing upright. The majority of training ground 7 was a forest that extended into the next training ground, which was 150 feet away. When they arrived at the training grounds, Kakashi motioned them to a spot with three poles. Alright, how about we introduce ourselves? Tell me your likes, dislikes, dreams, hobbies, and skills. Kakashi said, as he smiled at his team. How about you go first sensei? Sakura asked her sensei. Okay, my name's Hata Kakashi, and I'm an elite jonin of Kanahagakur. I like a few things, dislikes are none of your business, I don't exactly have a dream, and all you need to know about my skills is that I'm strong. Kakashi answered half-heartedly. The genin's sweat dropped at their sensei's answer. Alright bubblegum, it's your turn. Kakashi pointed to Sakura. Shanro. My hair isn't a bubblegum color, it's a cherry blossom color. The girl thought, as she introduced herself. My name is Haruno Sakura. 
My Lexa blushes as she glances at Sasuke, and my dream is once again Sakura glances at Sasuke. My dislikes are Ino Pig and Saibaka. My hobby is glancing at Sasuke. My skills are my intelligence, and I know a few medical skills. Sakura concluded her introduction. Kakashi then pointed at Sasuke to introduce himself. My name is Achiha Sasuke, the last loyal Achiha. I don't like much, and I dislike people inferior to me, and fangirls. Sakura looked ashamed when Sasuke said that. Dreams are irrelevant. My ambitions are to revive my clan, and to kill a certain man. My only hobby is training to get stronger. My skills are better than everyone in my class, as I'm the rookie of the year. Sasuke said smugly, as he finished. Sakura had hearts in her eyes while staring at the Ichiha. Both Naruto and Kakashi knew who Sasuke was talking about. Kakashi decided to ask Sasuke about it privately. Kakashi pointed to his last student, the pariah Kanoha. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. My likes are my friends, people that care for me, ramen, pranks, and reading. My dislikes are the three minutes it takes for instant ramen to cook, people who judge others without getting to know them, and getting chazzed around by the crazy snake lady. Naruto said, as a small chill went down his back. Kakashi shivered, as well as he knew only one person who used snakes, and she wasn't someone to be trifled with. My dreams are to become Hokage, and to find other Uzumaki, if there are any left in the world. The blonde continued. Sasuke snorted at Naruto's dream. As if a clan less dope like you can ever become Hokage. Sasuke smirked. Kakashi taught Naruto would start arguing with Sasuke. And said the Uzumaki calmly answered Sasuke's jab. Even if there aren't any Uzumaki out there, I'm still one. The blonde replied, as he pointed his thumb to his chest. Sasuke wanted to refute but couldn't, as it was also partially true for him, as well. He continued his introduction. My hobbies are gardening, and reading all sorts of books. My skills aren't anything special. Naruto lied with a straight face. Kakashi scanned Naruto for any hint of deception. It seems I really can't trust the academy reports on Naruto. He was able to prank me when I was in Anbu, either he's really good at stealth, or he's trying to purposely hide his skills. Kakashi thought while observing the blonde. Hey sensei, why are we here? Naruto asked, snapping Kakashi from his thoughts. Oh right, you're about to take a test that will determine whether you become genin or not. Kakashi answered lazily. What? The lone Kanoichi shouted. We already passed the test to become genin at the academy. Sakura protested. Kakashi showed a neutral face. That test determines if you have the potential to be a shinobi. The real test determines whether your skills are enough to be a genin. Only a third of the graduated students will actually become a genin. The silver-haired man answered. That means we only have a 33% chance of passing. That's unfair to us. Sakura complained. The world of shinobi is an unfair one, but you'll have to deal with it. Anyways, if you want to pass, all you need to do is get a bell from me. The one-eyed jonin said, as he held up two bells. But in Kakashi Sensei, there are only two bells. Sakura stated the fact. That means one of you is going to be sent back to the academy. Kakashi responded. Kakashi looked at his students for their reactions. Sakura was yelling how she and Sasuke were going to fail. Sasuke came fed with arrogance, as he believed he couldn't possibly fail. Naruto sat there silently, and didn't show a single reaction. Okay, either he's shitting his pants on the thought of failing or he's already thinking of a plan. Man he really is the most unpredictable ninja. Kakashi thought, as he was stumped again by the blonde enigma. Kakashi vs Naruto Sakura Sasuke. You'll have exactly one hour or when this clock rings to get one of these bells. Come at me with the intent to kill. The test starts now. Kakashi announced. At the signal, all three hopeful genins dashed away from the jonin. Looks like they're smart enough to hide. Now let's see here, I found Sakura in the bush over there. Not bad, but I'll need to help her blend into her environment more. Sasuke is in the tree couple feet away spying on me, pretty good for an academy student. Naruto is shit. I should have stopped Naruto from going into the forest. I'm definitely not going to search for him. Kakashi evaluated the three, and then pulled out Ichu Ichu. Paradise. He had placed his new stitch of Ichu book at home, to prevent it from collecting dust. Sasuke was infuriated with Jonin. He's calmly reading a book. Does he think I'm not a worthy opponent? The Ichiha fumed when he felt a tap on his shoulders. The raven-haired boy glanced up to find Naruto hanging upside down with his legs holding onto the branch. When did the dope get there? Hey Sasuke, you want to team up with Sakura? I have a plan. Naruto whispered to his new teammate. Hey Chen, I don't need your help. I'm an Ichiha, an elite. There's no way I'm working with your Sakura. Sasuke said before leaping off the tree to engage Kakashi. Naruto sighed inwardly, and went to find Sakura. When he proposed the idea of working together with her, Kinoichi refused, saying only she and Sasuke were going to pass. Naruto wished his teammates would at least try to cooperate with him. Shrugging his shoulders in defeat, the blonde went back to placing traps. Meanwhile Sasuke was attacking Kakashi with Tajutsu. The Chiha had yet to land a single hit on the Jonin, nor had he made Kakashi look away from the book. 
Sasuke was frustrated with his lack of progress, so he switched to ninjutsu. Kaden. The Kaku no Jutsu, Fire Release. Great Fireball Technique. Sasuke blew out a huge fireball towards Kakashi. The copy nin, seeing the size of that, disappeared underground. When the fire finished, charred ground took the place of the silver-haired man. Sasuke smirked at his apparent victory until hands grabbed him by the ankles and pulled him underground. Doten. Shinju Zanshu no Jutsu, Earth Release. Double Suicide Decapitation Technique. Kakashi said, as he jumped out of the ground. I must say, you surprised me with the size of the fireball, but you're too confident in yourself. Kakashi remarked before he leapt away to where Sakura was hiding, leaving a buried Sasuke. Kakashi was able to instantly fool Sakura with a simple Jinjutsu, and was now tying her and Sasuke to the posts. Looks like another team that failed to pass. It's quite a shame, seeing how Naruto asked them to work together. Now I have to find Naruto, since I'm required to see his skills, even though I don't want to. Kakashi shuddered and proceeded carefully into the forest. After what seemed like five minutes, the Jonin still couldn't find the blonde boy. As he placed his foot on the ground, a trap sprang into action. Kunai came from the left while Shuriken came from the left. Kakashi jumped into the air, only to pull a trip wire. An iron ball came from behind him, threatening to shatter his back. With a quick hawarimi with a tree branch, the copy nin escaped the iron ball. Just when the Jonin thought it was over, an explosion came from under him. Kakashi was able to escape in time due to his experience. Damn it. It's like he knows exactly where I'm going to land. I shouldn't have told them to come at me with the intent to kill. I need to get out of this forest. Kakashi thought, as he dodged two more kunai. Kakashi sped off towards the clearing where Sakura and Sasuke were held. Unfortunately, the two were no longer there. The silver-haired man figured they had gone back into hiding. So he waited but they didn't come out. Why hasn't the alarm rang yet? Kakashi wondered, as he walked towards the alarm clock. As soon as the jonin reached for the alarm, Sasuke appeared from the forest, and charged the copy nin. In the instant Kakashi turned around, a surge of electricity rang through his body. Kakashi collapsed to one knee, and looked to see a grinning Naruto. They grabbed the bells, and tossed them to Sasuke, and Sakura, who had also come out of the forest. I think we passed the test, Kakashi-sensei. Naruto said, as he released his seal. After a few quick breaths, Kakashi got up to his feet, and nodded. Sakura jumped up, and down, while also trying to hug Sasuke. The Chiha dodged her, as he smirked smugly. Naruto shouted for joy, and did a quick victory lap. Before I tell you why you graduated, tell me how you caught me. He asked his new students. Naruto decided to answer the question. When you went into the forest to search for me, I came here, and untied Sasuke, and Sakura. After I finished untying them, I reset the alarm time. I then proposed my plan once again, and they accepted when I told them I'll give them the bells. When you noticed that something was wrong with the clock, we initiated the plan. Sasuke appeared from the trees to distract you momentarily. I used Kawarimi no Jutsu to switch places with the clock, and I slapped a stun seal on you. You know the rest from there. The blonde explained. Kakashi nodded but was frowning inwardly. In the end, Naruto did most of the work to beat me. It seems like I have an R in Naruto without the laziness. A Sasuke can let go of his arrogant pride, and Sakura with her infatuation with him, this could be a really good team. I need to fix those issues before I train them. Kakashi thought while showing the trio a nice smile. Alright, Naruto congratulations on passing the test. He said, much to the shock of the three genin. You two will be sent back to the academy. Kakashi added, pointing to Sakura and Sasuke. Why? The Kanoichi hollered. Sasuke, and I are the ones who got the bells, not Naruto. He should be the one going back to the academy. She protested. Sasuke gave Kakashi a full-on glare. Naruto sat down wondering why he had passed, when it came to him. The actual purpose of this test is teamwork. The only one who actually displayed that was Naruto when he saved you two from the posts, and gave you the bells. Kakashi explained. Let me tell you a saying my friend once told me, those who don't obey the rules are trash, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than trash. Kakashi repeated Abito's words. He spotted that Sakura was about to complain, so he spoke again. Don't tell me that you two are better than Naruto. Out on the battlefield, titles from the academy mean nothing. The enemy could care less if you were the rookie or Kanoichi of the year. Sasuke, you're too arrogant, and think you can accomplish things on your own. Sakura, you only worry about Sasuke, and never once think about Naruto's safety. Naruto also has flaws that he needs to correct. When he set up his traps, he never thought about your safety. Kakashi finished talking. Sasuke gritted his teeth in annoyance, Sakura looked down in shame, and Naruto slowly nodded, as if he was admitting that Kakashi was right. Despite this, I'm passing all of you because I believe we have the potential to be a great team. Kakashi said to them. They all had smiles on their faces, although Sasuke's was a small one. So from now on, we're team 7. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic. Link is in the description. See you next time, till then sayonara.